everybody, my name is Naomi and I work for the Institute of Urban Ecology at Douglas College. Now that's kind of a funny job title. What do the words urban ecology mean? Well, the word urban means a place where people live, just like here where you live. And the word ecology is a type of science that looks at how all the living and non-living things in an area interact. We call those types of areas ecosystems. And so my job is really fun because I get to come work with people just like you and raise awareness about the nature in our cities. So take a moment now to pause the video and make a list or a drawing of all the living things that you share your urban ecosystem with. We're really lucky here in British Columbia because we get to share our urban ecosystems with more nature than most places on Earth. Did your list or drawing include insects like bees or spiders? Did you remember to include any plants? That's right, plants are living things too. And sometimes people forget these small things living in our urban ecosystems like insects and plants, but they play a really important role in our ecosystem. So if you forgot to add any of these things in, go ahead and take a moment now to add them onto your list or your drawing. Maybe you're working together with your class or some friends at home. So if you have time, go ahead and pause the video now and share what you came up with. Now our urban ecosystems today are in a little bit of trouble. There are some things out there that are hurting or damaging our natural urban ecosystems. So take a moment now and pause the video and see if you can make a list or drawing of some of the things that you think might be harmful to our urban ecosystems. Now I bet your list or drawing probably had something like litter on it or pollution or maybe even people accidentally walking and stepping on the bugs or plants and that's good. I like the way you think. But today I'm going to talk about another threat out there that's harming our urban ecosystems. You've probably walked right past one and didn't even know it was there. They can be hiding around your school, your home, or even your favorite park. You want to know what they are? They're called invasive species. An invasive species is a plant or animal that does not naturally occur here in British Columbia. It was brought over by people and now it is somehow harming or hurtful to our natural urban ecosystem. And now today with how popular it is and how easy it is to buy things online and have them shipped right to your doorstep really, really fast, like on Amazon or something, sometimes plants and animals can get shipped over from other places in the world too. Now sometimes it's on purpose, like if you're buying a new plant to put into your garden and sometimes it's by mistake, like if there is a little insect maybe hiding in that new plant that you just bought. We call these introduced species, meaning that they don't naturally belong here, but they live here now because of people. And now sometimes an introduced species can just live peacefully with our natural urban ecosystems, but if they start to cause a problem, then we call them an invasive species. So today we're gonna to be talking about the invasive plants in our urban ecosystem, just like this English ivy here behind me. There are some invasive animals in our urban ecosystems as well, but today we're just gonna be talking about the plants. So what problems do you think an invasive plant might have on our urban ecosystem? Take a couple minutes now and pause the video and think about this for a little bit. Are you ready for the answer? Invasive plants are often really strong, really 
fast growing and can spread really, really quickly and grow almost anywhere. Because they are so fast and strong, these invasive plants can often outcompete our native plant species. Those are the plants that naturally belong here. These invasive plants are like bullies and new plants or any plant for that matter, especially little tiny seedlings, need lots of water and sunlight to grow. And these invasive bullies, they take away all the light and water that the native plants need in order to survive. Sometimes these invasive plants can even be toxic to our local wildlife or the stems or leaves might be covered in lots of prickles and so the animals can't eat those. Some may even produce poisonous berries. All right, everybody, now raise your hand if you like to go play outside in your urban ecosystem and raise both hands if you like to go play in the forest. And now wave your hands from side to side if you like to go play hide and go seek in the forest too. Amazing. Well, today we're going to learn how to play another version of hide and go seek. But instead of looking for people, you're going to be looking for invasive plants. And now these are the invasive plants that you're going to be looking out for. This is English ivy. English ivy is an evergreen vine that can be found on the ground or climbing up other trees, walls, stumps, even the sides of buildings. It has thick, waxy leaves that grow in two shapes. Younger leaves are lobed, almost like a maple leaf, and have very visible white veins. The older leaves are not lobed and they're more glossy and they can reproduce with umbrella-shaped clusters of green flowers that turn into purple berries. The younger leaves do not produce flowers, so you may or may not see these, but they are still able to reproduce by sprouting new roots and nodes all along the stem. English ivy was introduced because it looks so cool climbing up the side of a building. English ivy grows rapidly and needs very little light or water once it's established. It can even grow during the winter. Unfortunately, it quickly forms a dense monoculture ground cover that suppresses and excludes other vegetation, and it's unsuitable for a lot of wildlife habitat. When English ivy climbs up a native tree, it can even deprive the tree's leaves of sunlight and eventually kill the entire tree. This is Himalayan blackberry. Be careful, this one's really prickly. The Himalayan blackberry bush produces pinkish white flowers with five petals in the early summer, and then those flowers will ripen into black raspberry type fruits later in summer. Its stems are called canes and they, they can grow up to three meters tall and 20 meters long and up to 2.5 centimeters thick. Its leaves are divided into five leaflets and are also prickly underneath, so again, be careful. If you think you found Himalayan blackberry, double check with your teacher or an adult before pulling it out. The Himalayan blackberry was introduced for its yummy berries. Birds and other wildlife helped spread the Himalayan blackberry into our native rainforest by eating the berries and spreading the seeds in their droppings. The invasive blackberry forms large, dense impenetrable thickets that can limit movement of large animals, take over stream channels and stream banks, and block land animals like deer and bears from reaching sources of fresh water. This is butterfly bush and you'll most likely find this one blooming in the spring and summer because it's deciduous and so during the winter it's going to lose all of its flowers and leaves and so it may be harder to identify. If you think you found butterfly bush, be careful because their flowers produce a lot of seeds. Now this tree or shrub might be too large to cut down entirely, so in that case just remove as many flowers as possible. But again be careful and pay special attention when cutting off flowers that are going to seed. Those are the flowers that are kind of dry and almost dead looking. Butterfly bush can be a tree-like shrub that gets up to 15 meters tall. Clusters of small purple flowers grow in long cone shapes about 4 to 10 centimeters long. 
and there are other colors possible as well, but purple is the most common. The flowers have four petals and an orange center right in the middle. This is key for identification, this orange eye spot right in the middle. The leaves are long, toothed, and oval, and they're arranged opposite along the branches. Butterfly bush can often get confused with non-invasive lilacs, but the lilacs do not have that orange eye center. So make sure you check the flowers really close. Butterfly bush was introduced as a popular addition to flower gardens as it can grow in very poor soil conditions and produces many beautiful flowers that attract a lot of butterflies. Unfortunately, butterfly bush easily escaped the urban garden and spread rapidly by its many wind-borne seeds. Butterfly bush displaces native vegetation in disturbed open areas along coastal forest edges, roadsides, and especially on sunny stream sides and river banks. This is English holly. Be careful, this one can be prickly again. English holly has thick, glossy, dark green leaves with sharp spines all along the edges. English holly can grow with a single tree trunk or can look more like a bush or vine. It produces very small white flowers that'll turn into red berries. These berries are poisonous to people and pets, so do not eat them. English holly can be confused with the native Oregon grape, but Oregon grape has yellow flowers and blueberries. The leaves of the Oregon grape are also spiny but they often change color from green to yellow, orange, and red. English holly was a popular ornamental evergreen shrub. It has become a serious invasive species though because it can tolerate both sunny and shady environments in the coastal temperate rainforest, and it's spread quickly by the birds that eat its berries. Holly's roots are especially problematic because they can easily outcompete native plants for nutrients and water. Native plants often die from dehydration when holly is around. This is Japanese knotweed. You'll most likely find Japanese knotweed in the spring and summer again because it is also deciduous, meaning it'll completely die off in the winter, so you may not even find the old stems left behind. Japanese knotweed can be identified by the brown, hollow, bamboo-like stems. And in the spring, New green bamboo-like shoots will quickly grow into adult plants. Clusters of small white flowers emerge in the late summer and stand upright from the branches. Japanese knotweed has large leaves that grow alternately on the branch. This is key to helping identify knotweed and the leaves are a shield or kind of heart-shaped. The roots of Japanese knotweed are the most problematic as they can grow through concrete and brick roads or walls. They grow strong and deep, however, so if you're trying to remove Japanese knotweed, do the best you can to pull up as many of its roots. Knotweed likes the moist soil and sun exposure alongside riverbanks. However, a single plant can grow up to 65 meters wide and easily block out native vegetation and lead to stream bank erosion. This cute little plant is called common periwinkle, and yes, even it is an invasive species. Common periwinkle is an evergreen ground cover, so you can find this species all year long. The leaves grow in opposite pairs. They're oval and they're about one inch long. In late summer, you can find blue or white trumpet-shaped flowers with five lobes. Common periwinkle is capable of forming dense mats along the ground similar to English ivy that can suppress and outcompete native plant species and prevent new seedlings from developing. All right, everybody, let's review with a fun little game of trivia. I'm going to show you a picture of four plants labeled A, B, C, and D. Three of those plants are going to be native plant species and one of them is the invasive. And I want you to just give it your best guess and see if you can try to figure out which one is the invasive species.
I think you're getting the hang of it now. And so if you are working together with your class, your teacher is gonna split you up into groups now. Or if you're following along at home, you can do this work alone as well. But before you go outside, you're gonna need the following supplies to help you. Every individual person or team should have an ID book to help them identify the invasive species again. You also need a pair of gardening gloves, a shovel, some shears or clippers, maybe a three-pronged aerator if you really want to dig down and pull up those roots, and you're also going to need a black garbage bag to put all your plant pieces into. If your team doesn't have all these tools, that's fine because the best tools that we have to work with are our hands. But be careful if you're pulling out any prickly Himalayan blackberry or English holly, okay? Now, if you think you found one of these invasive species hiding in your urban ecosystem, get an adult to double check before you start to pull it out. We don't want to damage any of the native plants or plants that are non-invasive. Once an adult says it's okay, then you can start removing the invasive species. But again, these plants are really strong and fast growing. So be careful and make sure that all the pieces of the plant that you rip off get put into the black garbage bag. Even if just a tiny little piece of the stem is left on the ground by accident, that little piece can reroot and start to grow a whole new plant. Also, you want to try to remove as much of the root system as possible. That grows under the ground and that's where the plant gets its water and nutrients from the ground. Again, if we just leave the roots under the ground, these invasive species are strong enough that they'll just grow back again next year. So use your shovel or maybe one of these aerators if you have and do your best to pull up as many of the roots as possible. Again, being careful that all those little bits and pieces get put right into that black garbage bag. Do be careful when you're pulling out these invasive species. You don't want to hurt any of the native plants that do belong here. And if for any reason you can't help pull the plants out, maybe you have a sore arm or a sore hand, that's okay. You can be one of our plant police. Your job will be to make sure that your teammates aren't damaging any of the native plants around and that all those little bits and pieces get put into the garbage bag and nothing is left on the ground. You can even search around your urban ecosystem for any litter and put that into the garbage bag as well. Just don't pick up anything sharp on your own. Now this is really important you guys. Before you come back into class, do one last check of the area you're working in and make sure that all those plant pieces are put into your garbage bag. Pay special attention if you find any berries left on the ground because the berries contain the seeds that'll grow into a new plant. Also, check your teammates and look for any little plant hitchhikers that might be hiding in their hair or clothing. This is another sneaky way that invasive plant species can spread throughout our urban ecosystems. So now might be a good time to pause the video and go outside and start removing the invasive species from your urban ecosystem. We call this habitat restoration. Now when you get back, I'll show you how to properly dispose of all the invasive plants that you just helped remove from your urban ecosystem. Welcome back everyone. Did you have fun out there? Now at your home or your school, you probably have a black bin for garbage, a blue bin for recycling, and a green bin for compost. Now, these invasive plants that you just removed can't be put into your compost bin. Why not? Pause the video now and give it your best guess. Are you ready for the answer? Because these invasive plants are so strong and so fast growing, 
they can start to regrow if you put them into the compost. Even though we cut them up into teeny tiny little pieces, if they get enough sunlight and water, they could start to grow into a new plant and then spread into a new urban ecosystem again. So why do you think we use these black garbage bags? That's right, we wanna keep out all the sunlight and water. So to properly dispose of your invasive plants, you're gonna follow these three steps. Step one, you wanna tie the top of your bag closed really tight so no water and no sunlight can get in. Step two, you're gonna check the outside of your bag for any hole. If you find a hole, just grab another one of these black garbage bags and we will double bag them again. Step three, you're gonna put one of these invasive species labels on the bag so that everybody knows to leave it alone and not disturb them. You're then gonna put that bag in a dark, safe place and leave it there until the plants inside die. This could take up to several weeks. So go ahead now and pause the video and take a moment or two to complete these three steps. Thank you so much, everybody, for inviting me into your class and helping to restore your urban ecosystem back to its natural state. There are a couple more things that you can do at home to help prevent the spread of invasive species. Number one, never dump any yard waste into a natural area. Always use your green bins. Dumping yard waste and even dead planters into a natural area could accidentally introduce a new invasive species into our urban ecosystem. Even if these planters look dead, remember these invasives are strong and they could easily come back to life. Second, help keep invasive species out of your home garden by planting native species instead. To find out more about other types of invasive plants that we didn't talk about today and to find some native plants that you can plant in your garden instead, look for the Grow Me Instead handbook for free online. I'll include a link down below in the video description as well. Again, thank you everybody for joining me today. And until next time, bye for now.